Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. It's uh, nice to, to be associated with such a great group of people. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're probably wondering what in the world is uh, the showdown in Langtree, Texas. Uh, it's an interesting case. Uh, you might ask yourself the question, um, is, it, uh, is it about the Wild West? Is it about a prize fight? Is it about Judge Roy Bean? Judge Roy Bean, now there is a piece of work. <laughs> uh, we'll talk a lot more about him later. Uh, but this is, story is a kind of a little bit about all of that together. Uh, and yet it's something broader than all that. Because there were some things going on in that time period in our culture, which I like to kind of refer to as an early version of the culture wars, which we've all been experiencing for quite a generation now anyway. Uh, it was an early version of that, which there was a lot of reform movement going on in this country. And the reform movement was designed primarily to uh, eliminate such things as um, graft and, and corruption, to uh, make a more pure America, uh, to paraphrase uh, General, I mean, uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush some years later, sort of a kinder, gentler America. It was a time period when um, it was the latter days of the American West, the Wild West, the classical Wild West period we, we take, talk about and think about in this organization. And uh, it was a a time that uh, many people thought of as sort of the closing of the war, of, 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 the, of the era. In, 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 in uh, 1893, I think it was, uh, 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 Frederick Jackson Turner came out with his uh, Frontier th Thesis, which basically contended that as of the 1890 census, that there was no longer a frontier in America. You know, centuries of American movies west with the frontier uh, identifiable as a culture and a civilization in the West, there was a kind of frontier that moved with it along the front of it. And according to, to uh, uh, Turner, that closed down in 1890. Now, there was a lot more to his thesis than just that. It was much more sophisticated, but that was a, an important part of it. Now, there was still plenty of Wild West land, but that was, again, kind of giving you the idea of the closing of an era and the opening of a new era that was occurring, and this huge reform movement that was coming along with it. Um, so if you look at these bullets up here, the story I'm talking about, the showdown I'm talking about, really focused around a heavyweight championship fight. Uh, each one of those bullets you see there is a you know, fascinating backstory about it. Uh, very fascinating. I could easily spend an hour on each one of those, but Pam wouldn't give me that much time. But it's a fascinating story about this and about the closure of the West. Um, now, speaking of limited time, you know, we have time to sort of hit the wave tops of this, but the wave tops themselves are fascinating. And, and the organization, the organizers of these programs probably are right. We need to keep these things brief. And as historians, you all appreciate the fact that the probably the greatest, one of the greatest presentations in history uh, lasted like 11 minutes. Abraham Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address. And conversely, some centuries earlier, Julius Caesar gave a speech that lasted five hours, and his best friends killed him. So, so I, I see some wisdom in that, we can probably profit from that experience. The, uh, I want to read to you, just in case some of you in the back can't read it, I promise not to read things to you, but I just want to read this bottom uh, little dialogue box to you, because it's kind of the thesis of what I'm going to talk about today. One of the most strange showdowns of the latter uh, Wild West era and brought no guns, no knife, no, uh, no bullets or anything like that. It created excitement throughout the state of Texas. An important point, it created excitement throughout the state of Texas and eventually throughout the entire United States. And um, it was simply focused around a prize fight between Boston Simmons and a guy named Peter Maher. Uh, and it put Lane Tree on the map nationally, and I might add it put Roy Bean on the map nationally as well. We'll talk a lot more about that fellow in a little bit. Uh, it was an amazing time. Now some of the characters uh, that are involved, you can see up here, 
Matt Masterson, uh, someone I'm sure that no one in this organization really needs a whole lot of uh, respect to make you about. Uh, by this time in history, he was his frontier gun fighting lawman days, adventuring days were pretty much over, but he was a nationally recognized authority on boxing and prize fighting. I might just make a point right now that, that the problem with this fight that caused so much generation was that it was a prize fight. In those days, boxing was kind of okay if it was just a manly display of skill and technical ability and so forth, with no real intent to harm your opponent. Hmm, okay. <laughs> kind, of, kind of like uh, sparring is, but with, with even with less intent to do harm. Whereas prize fighting, in the minds of the people at that time, that time, involved several other things. It involved money, it involved titles, and it involved the fight to the finish. Now, the fight to the finish, by that we meant you try to knock out your opponent or beat him so badly that he can't continue the fight. Well, that's kind of what the fighting's about. But in any case, that was what the reformers were against. They were against all kinds of things, such as um, uh, 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 vice, all kinds of vice and corruption. You know, with prize fighting, you got money involved, you got gambling involved, you got corruption involved. So that was part of the many things that were in their sights to try to eliminate from our culture this time. Around. And they had a lot of money behind them. The, the, the reformers had a lot of, of, of money, a lot of uh, political power, they influenced a lot of elections. There were a lot of politicians throughout the country who were beholden to the reformers. Therefore, they had to accede to some of their interests and demands. And right now, prize fighting is one of the things in, the, in their target area. Judge Roy B., we will talk a lot more about him. In some ways, he's kind of the star of the show today. Uh, and uh, we've already talked a lot about the Texas Rangers here. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll come back on a little bit and a little bit later. But also involved U.S. Marshals, uh, it involved local politicians and, and enforcement, law enforcement people at just about every level throughout that, that part of the country. And I want you to look at the two bottom bullets there. It involved, now get this, it involved the governors of two states, Texas and Chihuahua, and it involved the President of the United States and the President of Mexico. Uh, I, I just let that sink in a minute uh, about how you're getting a sort of sense for what a spectacular event this is. This is actually a media event. Uh, yes, they had media events back in the days of telegraphs and newspapers, just as we have it today in the days of internet and, uh, and social media. So it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a what we might call a media uh, feast going on there at the time. So these were the players, you can see them, all, all of these folks were significant players in the, in the old West story that we talked about here. Now let me just talk about the background real, real quick. The background is this heavyweight championship fight. And the fight was between, as I said before, uh, Fitzsimmons and Mopper. Now, a guy by the name of General Jim Corbett, that was his nickname, James Corbett, was the heavyweight champion. Some of you might remember the old movie star, Earl Flynn, General Jim, came out uh, years ago, like most Hollywood movies, very fictionalized, but, but a good movie. But he was, he was the heavyweight champion of the world. And the, the powers of the uh, authorities in boxing were trying to match him with the Simmons earlier. And they were running into so many problems with the various state laws and, and, and what have you coming to, together to try to eliminate prize fighting that throughout much of the United States, prize fighting was illegal in the states. Now, they're not in all states. Some states, Nevada, for example, never did have a law against it. But, but most of the states had some kind of a law against them. Some of those laws were fairly, uh, had a lot of loopholes were fairly porous, so you could find awful ton of ways to get around them. And some places, uh, local authorities just ignored the state laws. They had price, so you had all kinds of things like that going on at the time. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it was so difficult to make that match between Fitzsimmons and Corbett. That Corbett retired in disgust. He just got tired of the hassle. Besides that, he, he was more to develop his acting career. He was become quite a star in that. And that's a lot easier than boxing before making a living. Uh, not to demand uh, the man, he was a tough, plenty tough character. But um, 
He gave up and he announced that his successor would be Peter Maher. Uh, now, he really didn't have authority to do that uh, or the right to do that necessarily. Peter Maher was a legitimate contender, no question about it. He was the Irish heavyweight champion. He had come to the United States. He had fought a lot of top heavyweights here. And he was indeed um, a, a legitimate contender. Uh, but, he, you know, some people recognized uh, Corpus authority to announce his successor, but a lot of people didn't, most didn't. And so finally it made sense to match him and Fitzsimmons, and that's the heavyweight championship fight that all this spurred all this excitement and all this uh, interesting things. Now, it, it, it involved a guy by the name of uh, 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 Dan Stewart. Now, Dan Stewart was sort of an early version of uh, Tex Ricker, you may have heard of, big fight promoter of the later generation. Uh, Dan Stewart was sort of the Tex Ricker of his time. And he had been trying to put fights together and was very successful. And he decided that he was going to put together the Fitzsimmons Mother fight. He was going to have a fisty carnival. A fisty carnival. He was going to have all kinds of things. He was going to bring all kinds of fans in here. And he's going to do it in, in uh, El Paso, Texas. And uh, he was going to even see it on his chart. He was going to have preliminary fights and baseball games and football games. Football games were actually becoming quite popular at the time. Uh, even a bull fight was right across the river. You have Juarez, Mexico. Mm, you know, there's some latitude there. But some that, that might be getting Dan Stewart with a little flexibility. If things got too tight north of the border, he might be able to take his whole program down to Juarez. We'll see how that works out here in a minute. Um, but, um, but the, the point is that the governor doubled down on this. He felt challenged. He decided that he wasn't going to allow this to happen in the state of Texas. The law that they have was rather insufficient, so he decides to get a new law. So he goes to the legislature. He gets a new, more rigid law uh, prohibiting prize fighting in the state of Texas. Uh, and he doubles down and he says to Dan Stewart and announces basically to everyone, you're not going to have this heavyweight championship prize fight in the state of Texas. And, and I'm just to show you that I mean what I say, I'm going to send the Texas Rangers to El Paso. And he sent out all available Texas Rangers at the time to El Paso. Let's get that. All available Texas Rangers go to El Paso to prevent this, this fight. And when they get down there, they start shadowing all the principles and everything. And, um, and it, it starts to close in and get on to the Stewart. So the option to Stewart is to move down into Juarez or maybe go over to New Mexico. But the governor of Chihuahua says more or less as a nod, diplomatic <coughs> nod to the United States, not that he was really against prize fighting so much, but as again, as a diplomatic nod, he says, well, we're not going to allow this fight to occur in, in Juarez either. And to prove what he meant, what he says, he calls out the ruralities, and they come down there and they occupy Juarez. Now, Fitzsimmons was actually training in Juarez. And so, Maher was training over in Las Cruces, so I guess they thought, well, maybe that's an option, we can do the fight there. And the governor, the territorial governor of New Mexico, got his representative in Washington, in Washington to actually get the United States Congress to pass a law against prohibiting uh, prize fighting in the territories of U.S. territories. And Grover Cleveland, the president of the United States, signed this. And this is all fast track stuff done to prevent this heavyweight championship fight that we're talking about. And even the president of Mexico, Porfirio Diaz, comes out and says, we're not gonna allow the fight to happen in Mexico. So Dan Stewart feels like he's completely boxed in here, what's what the world is going to do. Um, enter a guy by the name of Roy Bean. Now you take a look at this map, and I'm sure you're familiar with Lang Tree Texas right here, kind of in the middle of no place in the manner of speaking. I kind of don't like to use that term, but it was certainly pretty vacant out there. And uh, Roy Bean was known wide, I don't know how wide at the time, but he was known locally as the law of West of the Pecos. I know you've all heard that. Um, and in many ways, that was the truth. And we'll talk a lot more about that here in a minute. I hope we're going to have a lot of time. Um, but he contacts Dan Stewart and says, I can have your heavyweight champion fight. Don't worry about it. He said, send all your equipment, the material you need to build a ring, and the equipment you need for the fight. Send it on a train from El Paso uh, down back to Langtree one day, and then the next day, 
you know, all the people involved, you know, the fighters and their resume, I mean, their, their, uh, you know, all their attendees, all the people associated, all your fans that are still with you, because a lot of them came down to, to El Paso, and then they started giving up, so the fans, fans started thinning out a little bit, but there still was a bunch of them, something like, uh, I think, nine uh, river uh, cars full of fans, and, and bring them all to Langford, bring them in that order. And I guarantee you, you will have a heavyweight championship fight. I am the law of medicine of the so Don't worry about it. Just get everything here, and I'll take it from there. And so that's what happens. Uh, they bring, they ship all their equipment from the trail. Roy Bean builds uh, a boxing ring just across the river on a little sandbar uh, in actually in Mexico. Now. It's just kind of vague enough. It's in the riverbed of the uh, Rio Grande, you know, is that the U.S. territory, is it Mexican territory? Actually, it was Mexico. Um, and you might say, well, gee, why? I thought the Mexican president said he wasn't going to allow that to happen in, uh, in Mexico. Well, if Langtree was kind of isolated out there, Northern Coahuila State was even more so. The nearest even village was 200 miles away. And the nearest authorities that might have been able to do something about it, even if they wanted to, was even farther away. So part of the genius here wasn't just getting everything in Langtree and getting it across the river, but it was the timing. By the time everybody figured out what was happening, when they started seeing the trains going east, and they started hearing you know, everything's going to Langtree, and they started hearing Roy Bean is involved in it, and all of these people involved know about Roy Bean, Suddenly they figured there's something up. And, uh, but there wasn't time to respond. You know, one day the equipment arrives, and the next day the fight arrives. Bingo, it happens, it's over. And uh, it happens to the timing. It was the timing. No one had time to respond to it on the Mexican side of the border. Um, and the American side of the border, the, the Texas Rangers came in the same train with the fans and the boxers. Uh, they were welcome to that. Actually, Roy Bean had a great relationship with the Texas Rangers. I hope we have time to talk about that. Uh, and so there was no real adversarial relationship there. There were two different sides of the issue. Uh, but, uh, but once the, uh, the Red News started moving down across the Rio Grande, the Texas Rangers said, you know, that's no longer Texas. My, our mission was to be sure that price fight didn't happen in the state of Texas. And we are accomplished our mission. And they stood down. In fact, by some accounts, they actually found a little promontory over on the American side where they could look down and watch the fight uh, when it occurred. So when Roy sort of fight occurs, and I've talked about all this stuff here already, uh, Fitzsimmons knocks out uh, Peter Maher in the first round. Now, it's almost anticlimactic, uh, but the fight did occur. It was a legitimate fight. Both guys were legitimate contenders. It wasn't a fluke. Uh, well, maybe it was just a fluke. Maybe that's what it was. But anyway, that was a legitimate fight that occurred, and the Timmons had the title of heavyweight champion the world sort Now, we won't get into it, but later on, he fights Kirk Perkins, decided to come out of retirement. They fought to get the title, and Fitzsimmons wins it again. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue, um, but the only winner, there were only two winners in this fight. One was, uh, of course, it's him. He won the fight. The other one was Judge Roy B. Roy B. made up in many ways. Number one, he made lots of money on selling cold beer. Yes, cold beer out there um, at highly inflated prices, both before, during, and after the fight. Probably the most uh, lucrative day of his whole life by far. But more important, he became famous nationally. He became a national. I'll use the word celebrity, and I don't know if that's exactly right or not. But everybody was interested in how this foxy old scoundrel down in Texas was able to outwit two national governments and two state governments who brought all the powers of politics and law enforcement to bear to prevent from happening, happening and this guy pulls it off. And it becomes, they become fascinated with that story. He becomes the subject of articles in national magazines. Uh, the uh, National Police Gazette was one of the popular barbershop magazines of the day. 
you know, they would have a big write up about it in the newspaper for writing stories about it. And it's this event, more than anything else, that kept Roy Bean alive as a, as a major character in our history. Um, and he was a fascinating character. I think without this event, he might just be remembered as a footnote or one of many, many interesting characters that pulled off interesting things. But having pulled this off this fight, uh, in defiance of all of that government authority and all that power, uh, and the fascination that it created in the nation as a whole made him really quite a, a significant historic figure. Uh, really, truly an interesting guy. Now, this is the little footbridge that he built across the Rio Grande there. You can see that. He did put all this together today. He built this footbridge. There's the boxy ring there. There's a little canvas uh, fence they put around it. Now, it's possible to sit up on these hills and watch the bike, surely couldn't see it very well. If you want, if you're a fight fan, you want to see what the action was, you need to pay your twenty dollars, get inside that uh, little canvas area there, and uh, and watch the fight. Uh, so, so this is not during the fight; this is before or after, because that was pretty well filled up the fans. So we still had a lot of fans there, not enough to make it a profitable thing for Dan Stewart, uh, but enough to make it a very profitable thing for Roy Bean. Uh, this picture here may well be a picture of that fight. You can't see it very well, but that guy right there is, that is Bob Fitzsimmons. I can tell it by his uh, receding hairline and his length, uh, lanky body. I know, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that's him. This could be uh, uh, Peter Maher, although I can't say that I actually recognize him. So. But there's a lot about this film, about this particular picture that makes me think it probably was really actually a photograph of that fight itself. Now you have to explain a few things away uh, about it, but you can't. Now there's a lot of other pictures out there that purport to be pictures of the fight that they're not, they clearly are not. But this one may be, it may, it may very well be a picture of the fight. This is a medallion that they cut for the, uh, for the fight, uh, for the time, and this here says, uh, World's Championship uh, fight, and it says uh, what uh, at uh, El Paso, Texas. Well, this was minted before they had decided to change and move the length here, of course. Uh, it says February 14th, 1896. Oh, well, it actually didn't happen on the 14th, it happened on the 21st. So the coin's wrong, but they had minted the coin before the, uh, the final. But anyway, they, they had to come out, including the meal. And, um, and again, the, the big winner of this, both in terms of financial success and, and personal fame and glory, was Roy Bean. Um, Roy Bean, I, I know he was a scoundrel in many ways. I know he enforced the law of West of Pecos, and in fact, he was indeed the law of West of Pecos for many years. Um, it was kind of a strange kind of law. Uh, it was a unusual, it was his version of the law, more than a strict interpretation of the law. And you might say, how in the world did the guy get by with it? How could he do that? He, I mean, in some ways, not, not always, but in some ways he ran that operation under like a personal five picture. And he held court, and he had findings in his court, and he his results were enforced. Um, and people accepted it. That is to say, the people, the local people out there, uh, that rough and tumble frontier kind of community, despite what what uh, uh, Frederick uh, Jackson Turner I said, that was still real big time frontier out there. Rough and tumble folks in a rough and tumble business, and Roy Bean was one of them. And they accepted him, and they accepted his decision. By the way, he had authority out there, so to speak, before he ever was appointed justice of the peace. There was something about the guy, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but there was something about the guy, he had an authority complex about him that people respected, they liked him. He was also more of a caring guy than what you come to realize. Uh, so uh, he, he, was the, he was the real deal. He was the real deal. He got by with it because the people, the local people accepted it, and the authorities in Austin accepted it because it worked and they couldn't get anyone else to come out there and do it, do the job. And, and everything got along. The Texas Rangers were actually the ones who got him uh, put into the position initially. 
because of the force of the character. All right, I'm running out of time, so I just want to make a couple quick points here before I go. Uh, one is, take a look at these pictures here. Uh, of he just kind of looks like a portly old guy with a white beard. But I want you to look at this picture here. Now, I think you start to get a sense for the guy in this picture. Now, he's clearly in charge there. He's clearly the most significant guy. All those other people kind of passively look at the camera. He's, uh, he's kind of cocky looking there, you know, he's kind of got kind of a cocky stance. I think you start to get a feel for, for the power of the guy in, in this picture more than the others you might see. Uh, that's a picture of the Jersey Lily, which was his combination of saloon and uh, courthouse. And by the way, you know, I took that picture myself just a couple days ago, and you might, uh, you might have heard that the original one burned down and that this is a replicate, and that's not true. But the original one did, in fact, burn down, but this one was was built, rebuilt by Roy Dean, and he actually practiced law and saloon keeping in this building here. He actually died in that in that uh, So this is an original building. Uh, docents out there tell me that that's about 65% of the material in that building right there uh, is original material from the time of Roy Dean. Of course, the rest is stuff to uh, uh, support. I'm not sure of that. Uh, that. You get it very well, man. That's very interesting. Guy. Okay, so you've probably seen all these movies about them. Uh, they're all fictionalized, highly fictionalized. You know, they touch base with a few reality things just to keep the story right. But it's mostly fiction. Most of what you hear about Roy B is fictional. Uh, but there is some truth in some of these stories and so forth. All right, I don't have time. I think I'm probably out of time. But let me just mention, I've got, I, I really can't leave without mentioning uh, the, the, something about the Texas Rangers. You may have heard about a uh, conflict between Bat Masterson and uh, Bill McDonald. We heard a lot about Bill McDonald yesterday, and uh, I agree with uh, pretty much everything that was said. He was a really neat character. And there's a story out that said that this, this, this Albert uh, Payne book, which they were talking about yesterday, uh, came out and claimed that there was a conflict on the train ride from El Paso out to Langtree that uh, they stopped off in Sanderson, Texas for, uh, I guess, to get fuel and everything for the, the, the vehicle and uh, for the train. And supposedly, they were, well, some of them went in to have a meal at a Chinese restaurant. And supposedly, Bat Masterson got dissatisfied with the service and threatened to hit one of the waiters with a caster. Now, I, I don't know where he got a caster out there. You know, they were entering one of the doors in those days. But, but supposedly he did that, and, and, and Bill McDonald intervened, said, don't, hit, don't strike that man, and according to the dialogue that Payne writes in his book, uh, Magic said, oh, you want to take it out? And McDonald says, I've done took it out. And they're, they're like, you know, uh, and he said, and so supposedly well, that Masterson back down. Now, did that event ever occur or not? Uh, Masterson, once the book came out, denied it, said it never happened, that he and McDonald respected each other too much, and that, um, it was, um, it, it never occurred. Uh, he denied what was like. Did it happen or did it not happen? Partly matters, uh, whether it did or not, is part of the lore now of the, the history of, of the, the, the era. Okay, thank you very, very much. Enjoy the video.